So you found our podcast. We are Mind Beyond the Mission. This is a podcast about veterans and their families and specifically mental health. What goes on in our lives? What goes on in our heads? We're not talking to you as doctors or professionals. We're talking to you about living with it and what it's like. Ryan McKenna, 19 years in the Canadian Forces. I'm joined by my partner, Larissa Lamrock. Veteran family member. I'm a proud military brat. My husband served in the military, proud military mom. And we're really excited about this podcast to delve into issues that are important to the veteran and family community. So join us as we talk about mental health from the perspective of veterans and their families. All right, so we're back with another episode of Mind Beyond the Mission, and we're talking peer support today. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're going to hit it from both angles as well. You know, I think for both of us, We've done peer support, but we've also received peer support. And I think for me, you don't always know what you're walking into, right? Like you can be going into a peer support session for the guy that phoned you and you may leave it an hour and a half later realizing, well, that might've been as much for me as it was for that person. Absolutely. And, uh, I mean, peer support is something I'm pretty passionate about. I was excited when you suggested the topic. And uh, it's just just Brian and I today, but I thought that was kind of fitting for peer support um, because peer support doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to have, uh, you know, a clinician running it or anything. It's just essentially peer support is just two people having a conversation that might have kind of a similar experiences or similar outlook on stuff. So as we we're preparing for this, I was thinking about what is peer support? Like, can you define it? And I think... Um, There's such a broad range, you know, of experiences and exactly to put your finger on what peer support is. But to me, at a basic level, it's two people having a conversation. And since sometimes it's so hard to define, you know, it might seem weird to say, well, it can be done wrong, but it can be done wrong. There there can be ways to walk it down a path that doesn't work and also to maybe be dangerous sometimes. So we're going to get into that a little bit. I'm going to tell you, though, like one of the best peer support sessions that I ever had uh, for a young man a number of years ago, and what was best about it was he never actually brought up in the session what his main problem was. His main problem was that he was considering things like self-harm, but he asked me everything else, like mm. job search and how did you find blending in with people. And at the end, as we were walking away, we were at a Tim Hortons, not so far from where I'm at. And he said, the one line he said as I left that session was what it was all about. He said, you made it. And I've always remembered that because you don't have to walk into these sessions with the perfect answer or you've studied X and you know it. In fact, that's generally left for other people. That's what the professionals are for. But what I realized in that conversation after we talked for an hour and a half about everything Mm -hmm. was the fact I was there to talk to him showed that it's survivable. Yeah. You can be here to talk to the next guy somewhere down the road. And um, that's one of the sessions that's always stuck with me. Yeah. To put your finger on peer support. So number one, I kind of alluded to the fact like for me, I think there's kind of a continuum of peer support. And it's interesting because I was at a conference recently and sitting at a round table with a bunch of folks who they were service providers for military families. And um, I'm a huge advocate for peer support. I delivered peer support for 15 years with a national program. And when I mentioned peer support, they kind of, yeah, well, you know, when you mention peer support to people, they kind of bristle or not maybe bristle, but they're hesitant because like peer support is its own expertise has grown f- and everyone assumes that it's formal. When you right. say peer support, it means formal. It means I'm going to sit down with someone. I'm going to talk about my problems. So I, I don't want to do that. And people are backing off of it. But um, I think one of the things that I kind of mentioned at the kickoff and want to talk about today is peer support isn't always formal. Peer support can happen when two people are just walking their dogs. Well, or, we do it when we're working. Oh, yeah, exactly. So I think that's one thing I want to put out there is, you know, um, peer support is kind of on that whole range and sometimes it's it's just about the basics of just being present, of just kind of modeling. And I provided peer support meetings with people before where I just sat with them while they cried. And sometimes that's all people need is just that presence. You know, I think what you're talking about, too, is that if practitioners are skillful and and brave to some degree, they can really start to see what they can do with peer support. For example, you know... 
if you're running a session and you've got six veterans in the room and you're going to start it with something to the effect of, let's all get in a circle and put our feet on the floor and start breathing together, mm. the eyes are going to start rolling. They absolutely are. But when a tier one operator or a former fighter pilot sits down next to you and says, guess what I'm doing? I put my feet on the floor and start breathing. This is how this exercise goes. Mm. We're in a completely different scenario. Mm -hmm. And that's a way that just the credibility of who that person is can be utilized to get people better. Absolutely. You know, I do give people some a little bit of credence, though, when they're nervous about peer support. Think about it this way. If you're going through med school, how long till the first time you get to sit in a room with a patient and you're the person that's the practitioner? Mm -hmm. We're talking the better part of a decade. And long walks Brian into the room with a coffee in his hand going, I'm just going to sit down and chat with this guy. Like, I can see why it scares the socks off some people. Okay. Right? And I think we've got to embrace that reticence, but do it anyhow. Mm-hmm. I agree with you. And I think there's benefit to both approaches and, and they can be complementary to each other. But I'm just curious. I want to ask you because this is something we haven't really talked about. Like, you know, that I was involved in peer support for a long time. I talk about it. I, I miss peer support a lot. Mm. And you have, you know, been involved in organizations that provide peer support. What was kind of your first introduction to peer support? For me, it was on the receiving end. And again, I look at the the mentoring and authentication side of it. The first peer support I ever had was an airborne guy who would go to the doctor. And right across the floor, when you look at someone you think is the hardest charger in the room, mm. and he's putting up his hand going, yeah, okay, I've got a problem, and this is what I do with it. That tone change, you can't buy that. There is no school that teaches that, mm -hmm. right? It's just bravery on his part. And you look at things that can spread poorly, you know, you can spread a sickness in a platoon while you can spread mental health well too, if done the right way. Mm. And I think that's the first bit of experience that I had with it. I would say though, the first intervention style for me was uh, probably about almost 20 years ago. And I got back from overseas and people could tell that I was buzzing a little bit, you know overcompensating maybe, making sure that the message that got out to people was what a great time I had. Mm. But people that knew me well enough eventually gave it a month, like, okay, what's up? Mm -hmm. And even then I pushed it away, but I knew who it was. I was sitting in a room with a bunch of Croatia vets who had been through worse. And, and even that thing of like what's worse and what's better, that can sometimes be the negative side yes. of – just having peers in the room where we, we try to find a scale. Yes. Right? I think it's even my instinct to do it now. But um, suffice it to say, they had the ticket punched and the check on their checklist of having been through a bad thing. Mm -hmm. When they spoke, I listened. That was it. The rank didn't actually matter. Like, these guys, as far as I could see, they ran the unit. You know, they spoke. Everybody listened. And that was, you know, how to do a section attack, how to do a patrol. Here's that guy telling me, like, Brian, it's time. Let's talk. So it sounded like it was people that already had credibility in your eyes. They had common experience. They'd been through something similar to what you've been through. One of the other things I'm hearing you say, though, and I hear it from a lot of other people, is um, someone approaches them. Someone takes the time to say, how you doing? Mm. No, no, no. I asked you how you're doing. How are you doing? And creating that space for someone to, first of all, feel seen. Um, and then creating a space for them to be heard. It's not too often that I've heard people like spontaneously putting their hand up and saying, yeah, I need peer support. It's about someone taking the time to approach them and opening the door um, and creating a bit of that trust for them to be like, okay, there is someone. I'm not in this alone because I think many people think they're the only one going through that experience. Well, it's the, the military term of a double tap. In other words, the first round normally doesn't get through the armor. The second mm -hmm. one does, right? And, well, we have armor. And so how are you? Pretty good. Nah. Mm. How are you? Mm -hmm. And that's normally all it takes for the person, even you, to go, uh, rough week. Mm -hmm. Like, no, well, now we're having a conversation. Yes. Right? And it's not more technical than that. But what I say, though, is 
I feel the people that are really good at peer support, they have to have at least one credibility somewhere else. Because if you've got a guy in your unit that's, you know, the peer support guy, but he doesn't excel or even meet the standard in anything else, guys aren't going to talk to that person, Mm. right? It's when you show up with some credibility, in my opinion, and I look and go, wow, that guy won the patrol competition and he's talking to me about how I'm doing, then it must be a worthwhile conversation. Right. But if you send me to go to the person, you know, I happen to have peer support relationships with some Padres, but because individually we're friends, Mm -hmm. but every time the units, oh, guess what? The Padre is going to be around. Like, well, it's not like we're lining up to go talk to him. Yes. Right. But you know what I might do in the corner while I'm talking about why I'm not in that line? Be talking to someone else. Right. <laughs> doing, having, doing peer support. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things I wanted to talk about too was, you know, I mentioned to me, I described it as a continuum. A peer support can be, you know, colleagues walking down the road, having a cup of coffee. It could be, you know, your dog walking group. It can be very informal and it can be all the way up to very formalized programs where people are trained coordinators, as an example. Um, you know, they cover a certain area. Yeah, that kind of more formalized piece. There's national peer support programs now where you phone in and they'll connect someone to you. But I think one thing that I wanted to put out there and talk about was, you know, what makes someone credible? And I think if someone is looking for peer support, number one, um, any one of those programs across that continuum could be the right one for you. I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. They provide something a little bit different. So what's the right fit for you? And then on top of that is finding the right person to connect with for you. So even within the same program, like, you know, when I provided peer support, I know this will be a shocker, but I'm not everyone's cup of tea. And I was okay with that. So, Tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm going to rustle papers here and then you'll you'll get it. Yeah. So I think for people who are looking for peer support, do some investigation, find out what like will fit for you right then and then find the person that feels right for you for then. So if you connect with someone for peer support and you don't feel that they quite got you, don't give up on it. Like just find the person that is the one that's credible for you or the one that you find that connection with. Yeah. And I think like, why are we always looking for another one of us? It doesn't have to be a carbon copy of us. You know, the veteran world's big, 600,000 people plus. The next veteran hasn't done the same things I've done. I haven't done what they've done. So it's not necessarily that you need someone that's, you know, walked exactly beside you. Mm. But it is more that they understand the general concept of what you're talking about. And I look at it this way is that, you know, sometimes when, say, governments – Governments make rules for the people stamping passports and the people that are, you know, maintaining all the buildings around us here. But the military is not just another part of the civil service. It is very, very unique. Its day job is the one percenter problems, Mm. the things that other people don't deal with. And just that reality does create a little bit of a inward looking of, guess what? We may look the same. But how come I can spot these guys from across an airplane and go, yeah, that guy's a vet? How, what, what am I seeing, right? And I'm not seeing into his soul. I can't tell what he's thinking right now. But there is a difference, and it's that difference that I'm sitting down with. So this actually really gets under the skin of some people that are close to me in, the per, in my personal life because their viewpoint will be like, how can you talk to this guy you bumped into at the mm. airport mm-hmm. and I'm your mom, you know, right. we've been best friends for 30 years. Like, yep, you have mm-hmm. been murdered. No. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go talk to someone who has. Right. And I think that plays into it as well. Mm-hmm. For sure it does. I mean, you're a father, but you have not given birth to a child. So, I mean, there's only so far that conversation with you and I could go. I mean, you know, so you're looking for someone that might have that understanding or that common experience for sure. Sometimes it's the connection thing. Sometimes it's the protection thing. Like, do you really want me to talk to you about child trafficking? Because I saw a lot of that. That's not day-to-day transactional conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of us, we feel that if the thing that's burning on our minds 
is somewhat tricky and nasty, while there's like 1% of the world I'm going to talk to at times. Mm -hmm. I think one of the other things for me too is it's about what's not said or what you don't have to say. So, you know, I provided peer support for some first responder families as well. And at the time, I was not a first responder family member. I am now. But there was kind of some universal things. Like it didn't matter that my spouse was a military veteran and their spouse or their child was a, a police officer, for example. There were some things that we had experienced in common. And once we kind of established that we'd experienced those things in common, for example, witnessing our spouse have a flashback, mm. we didn't need to go into that anymore. We just, you know, you make the eye contact. Okay, I see that you get it. And then from there, we can move on to, you know, how did you deal with that or, or different things. There's sometimes things that are just unspoken and you still feel understood. I think one thing that helped me a lot um you know, there's there's many good doctors out there, but it was actually a guy out uh, in the West Coast that uh, was running a program I worked on, and he sat me down when we were doing formal peer support, and he's the one who really taught me that it's not the details, it's the emotions around mm -hmm. them, right? That changed my thinking. I have that saying at the tip of my tongue today, and and I'm a better peer because of it. And his point was simple. And it wasn't that, you know, if you went to a bad incident that had four casualties, you don't need to find someone else that was at a bad incident with four. Mm -hmm. And if you're at the guy with the bad incident with eight, that doesn't mean you have to shut up because his is worse. Right. Right. We need to park that. If at that moment you felt abandoned, that's the thing that we're talking mm -hmm. about. I think this is really important. So, you know, I sit on a committee that has a number of representatives from different peer support organizations across Canada. And this is a group of passionate folks. And the conversations are so interesting because everyone has a different perspective and experience on peer support. And I had kind of said at the beginning of these meetings that every one of those people is going to come forward and tell us that their peer support program is the best one. Yeah, right. And every single one of them are, are right because for, for the peers they're serving, that is the best one. But I guess where I'm going with that is you and I will be sharing our own experiences and opinions of peer support. Everyone might not have the same perspective or opinion, but just to start a conversation for people who aren't familiar with peer support or thinking about peer support, I think this is an important conversation to have and I hope it'll lead them to ask more questions. So I want to ask you, what are some things in your mind that peer support isn't? So for me, as an example, my opinion is that peer support should not be about sharing war porn, for, as an example. Like, it's not um, for people who might be wondering, you don't sit down and talk about every excruciating detail of your trauma. Because if you're sitting across from a peer, it's just it potentially could be triggering and difficult for them. But as you're talking about, um, maybe it's more about how did that incident make you feel and on the days when you're remembering how that made you feel, how are you getting through that day? So my question again is, uh, like, what do you think peer support isn't? I think out of the kindness of our hearts, when something works for us, we want to spread it. And if you do that the wrong way, you're going to take on the appearance of a doctor and you aren't one. Mm. So I think that's what it isn't. It's not direction. It's not medical advice. One clear example in my own history was, well, it was other peers that made me consider the service dog program. Hmm. And I'm happy that they did. And everything was going fine. And you know what? I have nothing bad to say, but I can look back at this point and remember talking to other people and telling them, no, you need to get an elk hound. You know why? Because I have one and she's amazing. Therefore, this is what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And it's that last statement that's where you don't go, mm -hmm. right? Everything up until then is true. This is what other people recommended to me. I'm finding it's working. These are the things I'm getting out of it. It's all positive. And now what you need to do is buy leg brace X or no, you shouldn't be on that pill. I was. Mm -hmm. My doctor moved me off of Fexer and onto X. And so you need to go. That's where we're wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's my sense of it is. It comes from the best place, Larissa, right? It's like, I think veterans are so desperate to get healthier that they'll try anything. Right. Well, they'll recommend anything too. And 
even in your own history, you might look and go, okay, well, this thing worked. Now, did it work? Or was it the thing that pulled the clog out of the drain Mm. and then everything started flowing behind it, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm a peer support specialist. That is what I specialize in. I'm not the one that can actually look at myself and go, when did I get better? Or when was all the groundwork that got me to that point? So if I think that it's because I came off that pill or put on that knee brace or had that type of dog, Mm. that's what I'm going to tell you to do. Mm -hmm. What if that's the absolute wrong answer for you right now? Right. So, I mean, it sounds like peer support can be like one contributor or one tool to put in the toolbox. And that recovery isn't about just one tool in the toolbox. It's about tapping into a bunch of different things. So maybe, you know, people can tap into peer support, but they're also maybe tapping into yoga or trying you know, something different and all of those things kind of lead you towards, uh, towards recovery. I think that's kind of an important consideration. So you said at the beginning that you miss it. Mm -hmm. What do you miss? I just miss my community in that way, miss my peers. So while I was the peer support provider, it's interesting because I worked really hard to try and find a balance. I wasn't there for my own peer support. That was something that I had to be conscious of. This is about the person I'm sitting across the table from. I'm holding space for them. If I need to get stuff off my chest, I need to go to the person I go to for peer support. But that's not to say I didn't still get something out of there. My peers taught me so much. I took a lot away from those meetings. Um, So I do miss that part of it. Um, And it's very rewarding. As difficult as it was, it's probably one of the hardest things that I've done, you know, work-wise. And especially because I live it every day, Mm. that was difficult too. But it was so rewarding, especially when you could see people who were, who felt so alone. They were at a point of desperation. They felt disconnected. Even if it was just for that hour with a cup of coffee, if they felt someone understood them and then maybe walked right back into difficult stuff, at least I gave them that reprieve and could give that different perspective to them. So yeah, just lots of layers of stuff um, that I, that I really do miss. So when other family members would come to you to talk in general terms, no names, no pack drill, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What were they looking for? It's interesting. I think a lot of them didn't know what they were looking for when they first came. And I would often ask them like, what made you reach out? And they just, a lot of them not all of them, but a lot of them wanted tools and strategies. Like, what can I go home and do tonight that's going to make a difference in my household and support, you know, my veteran or my loved one? And uh, I'm smiling right now if people can't see because it just, it was just so interesting to me that the first time I would sit down with peers and I would ask them, like, how are you doing? They would proceed to tell me how their loved one, you know, uh, missed taking their medication for three days in a row. And uh, there was a, a their clinical appointment that they slept through and they had, you know, three nightmares in that week or whatever. And they would proceed to tell me how their loved one was doing. And I would let them do that because they're so tied to their loved one. But then I would say, okay, thank you for telling me all that, but I want to know how you're doing. And so often when I asked that the second time and just was quiet and held that space, they would break down because I think for a lot of family members, it would be the first time that someone would ask them that question um, and not just breeze past it when they answered by how their loved one was doing. Um, So I think family members were looking for tools and strategies. They were looking for validation, even though they might not have known it. I think they were looking for maybe permission to focus on themselves It might have been individual, but those are some of the overarching things that I saw for Mm. the family members. And just acknowledgement that that they were impacted in their own right. So as we were talking about, there's lots of peer support programs, some national, some local. You're more hard-pressed to find ones that have carved out that niche for the specific needs for family members. I think for a lot of my peers, what they're looking for is a place to say, that it's really hard to come back to Canada and that that's okay. Mm. You know, the lands of bombs and bullets and rockets and things like that, and it's not all like that. Like, let's be fair, there's bombs and bullets and volleyball and poker games. Like, that's what those environments have. Mm -hmm. But it is really hard to come down that escalator, and no one at the bottom of the escalator wants to hear that. Mm. Nobody wants to hear that coming home to me is hard. We We believe it's joyous and it's a family reunion. It's like, well, my experience is that give it seven days and like half those guys would go back Mm -hmm. if it was humanly possible. And why? And it's so hard to explain to the people you really, really do love that 
well, it's not you, but it is this environment. It is, I don't feel I belong here anymore. Those things like good luck trying to tell that to your wife mm. four days after you've come back from somewhere. And I wouldn't recommend it, by the way. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's a reason we do decompression training with your peers. Mm. There's a reason that, you know, we don't say, go on a six week vacation right now. We do disembarkation leave and then you've got to come back. There are reasons that the military has structured how you come home and they kind of like release you to your home in stages and it's wise, right? But I think it's only really in a group of peers that you're going to hear that come out, at least come out right away. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what peer support can do at its best. You know, like you're not saying, I don't want to be with my family, but it might come out like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe try it with Bob first. Yes, that's right. Right. And I think one thing I want to point out too is that, I mean, you and I sought out peer support for our own experiences. So you're talking a little bit about that transition piece and integration that that was difficult. So you turn to your peers. Um, for me, I, you know, provided peer support around operational stress injuries within the military, but peer support can be for whatever you might be experiencing. So as a veteran, uh, you might be experiencing chronic pain. There's probably groups for that. It might be military sexual trauma. It could be, you know, a whole range of things. And for family members, um, again, it could be, you know, my, we we're talking about mental health. That's what Atlas is focused on in our work is. So you might be seeking that as a family member on how to support your loved one with a mental health injury, or it might be, you know, a toddler, your mother of a toddler, and you're looking for that. So just wanted to put out there that, you know, you and I are speaking to our own experiences, but seek out other peers for what you might be looking for that validation on or where someplace where you're feeling stuck. There's like a whole range of uh, folks who have probably gone through something similar to what you did. And I find too, like, if I look at the last bit of my time in uniform where the writing was on the wall and I knew it was coming to an end, as you're doing some activities that are, you know, relatively fun and interesting, the traditional army stuff, shooting, training, that kind of thing. I remember as those things were happening, thinking to myself, like, man, I'm going to miss this. Mm. That's the last time I'm going to fire that, repel off that, that kind of thing. I don't have any of that sensation now. It's there. If there was the opportunity, yeah, okay, I would I would go scratch that itch. But that doesn't... Uh, there's no pain from that, right? Mm. I wish that I'd have had a good, honest conversation with each one of the guys that was there. That's what I miss. And, well, there are ways that you can handle that. In fact, you'll find they probably miss you too. Phone them, mm -hmm. right? And I get a lot of that out of, I guess, peer support now. It, it's just... It doesn't even have to have the support side to it sometimes. Right. That will just naturally happen. Mm -hmm. It's just, can we find a, an excuse for the five of us to be in a room together? Mm -hmm. You know, if I ride in a van in circles around Vancouver, but the people in it are fun, I promise you I'm going to have a blast. Mm -hmm. It's not about where we're going. But that's probably something in that whole transition phase that, that shocked me. I thought I was going to miss the stuff, mm -hmm. the things. And I definitely do miss the operations, but... Every soldier knows in the back of their mind that there's going to be a time where the knees and the hips give out and you don't get to do that anymore. But till the day I die, I get to phone those guys, mm -hmm. right? And it is sometimes the conversation. It's also sometimes just a smirk from the other end of the room, knowing exactly what that person's thinking. That's peer support too. It's connection. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's feeling connected. So yeah, it's the people. Yeah. But what about it, right? Exactly. You know, we talked a little bit about peer support isn't. I think for people who are maybe interested in peer support, it's okay to ask questions. Uh, you know, just like you're shopping for a, a new car or whatever. If you want to find a new clinician or a new doctor, ask some questions. If you're wanting to engage with peer support, ask some questions. Ask questions about, you know, how they maintain confidentiality. I think that's something that a lot of people are that's important to them, especially within this community. Ask what type of peer support. Is it one-on-one? -on -one? Is it group support? So just encouraging people to do a little bit of education. Um, you can get online. There's places to look that show you a map of uh, peer support across Canada and, and uh, you know, if it's the right fit for you. 
One thing that uh, I want to talk about with you, though, is if people are providing peer support, mm. support for the supporter. So mm-hmm. like I said, for me, um, I loved uh, my job doing peer support. Um, it was a full-time job, talking to other families, supporting someone with operational stress injury, and then I would go home and support someone with operational stress injury. Um, and it was sometimes hard to separate that because you're drawing from your own personal experience. You're yeah. being authentic, right? Like you... I wasn't silent the whole time I was sitting across from people. I would disclose a little bit for them to know that I understood them or that I could see where they were coming from. So peer support, sometimes you're giving a little tiny piece of yourself when you're sitting across from your peer, or it might be triggering for something or reminiscent of something you went through. So let's talk a little bit about support for peer supporters. Put it this way, if there's a no-go zone in Mm. your own life, a peer support group will probably go there. If you're doing it in the truest sense of, you know, like, Larissa, I don't know what's going on right now. Can we chat about it? The well, that could go anywhere. Could be kids, could be job, could be anything. And I think that's one of the things you have to square up with when you walk into these situations is, do I have any, you know, demons I don't want dusted off? Because that's going to happen. And then when that happens, okay, well, what about it? So- If you walk into a peer support circumstance and you don't already know exactly who you're phoning were a problem to come up, you've probably skipped a step. I think there's a number of things you just touched on. I think as a peer supporter, it's important for you to explore that for yourself, what the no-go zones are. And it's okay to communicate that with your peer. Like, even if they're getting into something and going, okay, well, wait a minute, like, you know, I want to be here available to you. I'm really glad you're opening up to me about this. It's really close to what I experienced. And, you know, for my own boundaries, I'm going to like, I'm going to have to ask that we not talk about it. Maybe on another day, maybe I can connect you with someone who you can talk to. So I think as a peer supporter to understand where your no-go zones are and know it's okay to set boundaries. And then, yeah, absolutely taking care of yourself. So, you know, setting up appointments for uh, your own clinical support after, or if you have a mentor within your program or um, organization, reach out to them. Um, For me, I have someone that I lean to um, for peer support. So I might debrief to a certain degree with that person. So I think for peer supporters, it's important for the program that they're working for to be able to support them and, and, you know, turn to your program or organization turn to your colleagues, but also, yeah, making sure that you're putting gas in your own tank too and exploring a lot. And it's really hard as a peer supporter. I don't know about you, Brian, but for me, it was hard for me to watch other folks struggle. It was Mm. hard to watch their Mm. pain. And I would almost kind of try and sit in it with them, which is not always a good thing to do. But I did peer support. I still try and keep contact with some peer support organizations because I was passionate about it. And when you're so passionate about something, it's hard not to give too much of yourself there too. So I was uh, on a crabbing trip in Vancouver and uh, out on a boat with a buddy of mine, throwing our traps out and we're chatting. And we had both been on a mission together overseas where we didn't know that the other guy was in the country. Mm -hmm. Good friends, but we just hadn't put two and two together, ran into each other at a bombing, right? It's one of the funniest things in my life now. It's like, I have a joyous moment from a bombing. I actually, for that, like 30 seconds of running into him, I had a really good time. Mm. Well, that's not normal conversation of what a great time that bombing was, right? But I find it funny. He finds it funny. And so we're on this crab boat and we're talking about and having a good laugh. And as we start walking through certain things about that experience, we realized that we remember it differently. At that point, it was only about four years after the event. Now, I'll say 14, 15, some odd years past, we remember it exceptionally differently. And we were actually getting mad at each other over the fact, like, no, you're wrong. We craned that thing up at this time, and then this happened. Mm -hmm. And And I remember that conversation. We're actually getting frustrated with each other, not a good time to do it with only two people. And it's his boat, by the way, okay. bad idea. Do you know how to swim, Brian? Uh, thankfully. <laughs> but as we, we just got to this point, it's like, who cares? Doesn't matter. And then, and this is where the peer support training took over. Cause we both kind of had a bit of it. We started talking about, okay, what are the things that we felt then that we can still remember feeling now conversation was back on. Mm. That was a teaching moment. 
I learned a lot there. One, how not to get thrown in off a boat, but also why did we get hung up? And it's this is what we mean by the war porn thing. Mm-hmm. It's a term a lot of people don't like. But what we're referring to is it's not that the details are inconsequential, but to why I'm suffering right now, they might not actually matter. But if we felt that incident was avoidable, and we both do, that's what's bothering us. If we think it was handled poorly, reported wrong, if we felt isolated and hung out to dry, and we both do, it's like, well, there you go. That's the mutual connection we have, is how that event made us feel, not did they crane the bus up at this time versus that time, right? And so in the world of peer support, I'm not telling uh, people to go and have their own crabbing story with their friend, but I am saying that I have learned that what works for me is it actually doesn't matter for me as to, you know, whether it had eight or nine people or it was a Wednesday or a Friday. Who cares? But that bothered you at that level, and I get it. Mm. I get that. I feel that. That's what it's all about. I think part of my intention for the podcast is to be open about our experiences, talk about topics that might be relevant and that maybe for somebody listening, it might give them a piece of information or it might motivate them or validate them or whatever the case is. So if there's someone listening to this episode of Be Peer Support, they've been isolating themselves. They don't think anybody else understands. Like I said, whatever the mechanism is, um, you know, whether it's tour or harassment or assault, whatever, it doesn't mm. matter. You're feeling alone in that. What would you say to that person that's listening right now about um, what do you want them to know about peer support? Well, I want them to know what I got out of it, not because they're going to find exactly that. But again, it's kind of like what we opened with. I feel relatively happy. I feel relatively secure. I feel that my life is generally moving in a positive direction. And those things can be felt Mm. after struggling, after going through therapy, still struggling, as you know, still have bad days, still have bad weeks, but it's survivable and better yet, you can thrive through it. And that's kind of the modeling aspect of it. I don't think the job is to go find the other guy in the 600,000 that matches your exact set of experiences. You can, you probably will find one, but that's not what we're going after. For me, uh, a lot of it is, do I know what the emotions are from there? Do you? All right, let's talk. Mm -hmm. I think that wraps up another episode. Did another one. Well, look at that. Exactly. Well, thank you all for joining us on another episode of Mind Beyond the Mission. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Mind Beyond the Mission. If this conversation resonated with you or helped you in any way, I encourage you to subscribe to Mind Beyond the Mission wherever you listen to your podcasts, so you'll be the first to know when our next episode comes out. And if you know someone who might relate to what we've shared or could find it helpful, please feel free to send it their way. We're all on the same team. Plus, we'd love to hear what other topics you'd be interested in us exploring in future episodes. Brian and I have a lot of ideas and subjects we plan to dive into, but you, the listener, have probably experienced or thought of topics that haven't crossed our minds yet. Please reach out if this is the case. We're on social media at Atlas Veterans CA on most platforms. So please feel free to tweet at us, send us a message, or leave a review on this episode. And let us know what else you'd like to hear us talk about. Brian, it's always a pleasure having these important conversations with you. Looking forward to next time. You bet, Larissa. Take it easy.